Okay, we want to welcome you to the Dallas Independent School District STEM Environmental Education Center virtual field trip. I want to say a very special welcome to Arthur Kramer, M.T. Riley, Rosemont, Jerry Junkins, Ignacio Zaragoza, Azar Chavez, and Williams Tag, all from the Dallas ISD. Thank you so much for joining us on this beautiful, beautiful winter afternoon, the first day of March. Uh, teachers, if you're watching and you're not signed up, please do so. Go to www.tiny.cc slash 3 5 registration. We would appreciate if you sign up. Uh, program today is Patterns of the Sun, Earth, and the Moon System. During this virtual field trip, students will analyze data to identify sequences and predict patterns of change in shadows, seasons, and the observable appearance of the moon over time. Mr. Dominguez will talk about the day slash night. Ms. Ram will tell you about shadows. Seasons will be discussed by Ms. Ramirez, and Mr. Monroe will tell you all about the lunar cycle. Students, you cannot ask us a verb, verbal question during this program, but you can go to www.tiny.cc slash question space answer. Send us in your question. I'll do my best to answer them during the program. If not, I'll send the answer to your teacher and they can discuss them with you. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and Mr. Dominguez is going to tell you about day and night. Hey guys, it's a very beautiful day here at the EEC and today we are going to talk about the day and night cycle. So we are going to answer some pretty simple questions in this portion of your virtual field trip. How does night happen and how does day happen? And we are also going to check out some pretty cool animals that are active throughout different portions of this cycle. So as you can tell, we have some goats here and they are very active during the day. So that means that they are diurnal. So here comes Benji and some of his pig friends, but we're also going to check out some other animals that are active during the night. Those animals are nocturnal. So let's get started and let's figure out how day and night happen. All right guys, so we have this pretty awesome model of our solar system that you can find uh, on NASA's website. And the way day and night work is pretty simple. So the Earth rotates around its axis. So the Earth is always rotating. And as you can see, a part of the Earth is dark. And why is that? Well, Look at the part of Earth that's facing the sun. It's not this part, it's this part over here. So in this portion of Earth, it is currently daytime. And on the side that is not facing the sun, it is nighttime. So as the Earth rotates around its axis, this side that is currently dark, will eventually rotate towards the sun and it'll be daytime when that happens. So the earth takes 24 hours to do a full rotation around its axis. So that is how we get daytime and nighttime. Pretty simple, right? It is the rotation of earth around its axis and it takes about 12 hours for this portion of Earth to rotate towards the sun and another 12 hours for this portion to rotate towards the part that is not facing the sun. Most of the animals that we have at our center are active during the day. So our cows, our goats, we have bearded dragons and tortoises, all of these animals sleep during the nighttime and are active during the daytime. So they are diurnal. So we are diurnal animals too. But I have some pretty awesome geckos at home that are active during the nighttime. They sleep during the day and come out to hunt during the nighttime. So they are considered nocturnal. Here we have Chewy. He is my Chihuahua gecko. Chihuahua geckos are native to the island of New Caledonia and they are excellent climbers, but he's not showing you a very good example of 
what he truly can do. He's got some uh, pads and claws that are perfect for climbing. So these guys in the wild live very high up uh, in the trees and they usually hunt for insects. They are uh, primarily insectivores but will eat some fruit from time to time. So here we have Chewy slipping on his uh, food dish. He's being silly. Well, not all animals are active during the day. Some are active during the night. They are nocturnal. Did you guys know that there's actually some animals that are neither nocturnal or diurnal and are actually most active during the twilight hours of the day? So they are most active when there is very little sunlight. So think of dawn and dusk. Uh, I have an uh, I have a leopard gecko right here, and leopard geckos are considered crepuscular. So that is the term to use when an animal is neither nocturnal or diurnal, but instead uh, are most active during the twilight hours of the day. So I usually feed them. I usually feed my leopard geckos before I go to work because I wake up at around 6:45. Uh, and that's usually when the sun is just rising. I also have a few of their cousins, the African fat-tailed geckos, and that's another species that is also crepuscular, so most active during the twilight hours of the day. So here we have Luna, my leopard gecko, enjoying some roaches. And finally, we have diurnal animals. We have these cows. You and I are diurnal animals and we use every bit of the 12 hours of daylight that we get to work, to go to school, to play, to learn. And I know that these cows are enjoying some daylight along with the heat that that wonderful star we call the sun provides. So they are relaxing, eating some grass, and when nighttime comes, they'll rest. I hope you enjoyed this portion of your virtual field trip. I will see you guys next time. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, Mr. Dominguez. We did have a question. Why are days shorter in winter? During the winter, the sun's rays hit the earth at a shallow angle. The sun's rays are the more spread out, which decreases the amount of energy that has hits any given spot on the earth. The long nights and short days prevent the earth from warming up. And now, Ms. Ram is going to tell you about shadows. Hey, everybody. It's Ms. Ram. And let me get my little screen going. Doo -doo -doo -doo. All right. At the end of my part of the field trip, you'll be able to predict patterns of change in shadows. So our essential questions are, what time of day are the shadows the shortest? And why do shadows change? change their length. All right, so our quick definition and quick reasoning behind shadows is um, shadows are formed when an opaque object blocks the path of rays of light. So opaque means solid, so you can't see through it. So if you can't see through it, then light can't get through it as well. So the opaque object does not let the light pass through it. And the light rays that go past the edges of the object or material um, make an outline for the shadow. So of course, whatever object you have, that's going to make the shape of the shadow. All right, so you're gonna hear me use these three words, transparent, translucent, and opaque. So transparent is when you can see through something completely. So like a window, uh, you can see everything through it. Then translucent would be something like a tinted window, um, or maybe a colorful window or a window with film on it. So you can see some through it, but not everything. So um, that is translucent. Some light gets through and some is blocked. Then we have opaque. And that's like if you had um, the blinds or the curtains drawn, uh, you can't see through them at all. It's completely solid. So I did a little experiment with a flashlight and a few different objects from my classroom. So I got some bottles like water bottles and vases and um, wanted to do an experiment and see what the shadow would look like. 
So the first one is a syrup bottle and it is transparent, but it's still caused a shadow. So in the middle, it's mostly transparent, it's flat glass, but then towards the outside, the glass is thicker and it's doubled up. So a lot of the light is bent and blocked. So this one, the middle that is truly transparent did not cause a shadow, but the outside where there was um, thicker edges and um, doubled up glass, it did block the light. Then I had a green uh, colorful bottle and you could see it caused a shadow once again, especially on the outside, but the middle that was kind of translucent, um, you could still see the green light showing through. Then of course my solid um, steel water bottle blocked all of the light. And so you could see the shadow there behind as well. And that's something you could do to experiment different um, objects around your house. I found all these vases and bottles because I have a lot of flowers and things like that. So you could experiment with different things you find. All right, so sun throughout the day. We know that of course the sun rises and the sun sets. So this place or this um, collage kind of is supposed to be a time lapse from the same spot to show how the sun travels across this bay area. So you can see the sunrise then throughout the day at different intervals and then once again at sunset. So it kind of looks like the earth or it looks like the sun is traveling in a big arch. So um, we see that it's at the lowest at sunrise and sunset. And then around noon and the middle of the day is when it's at its highest point in the sky. So how does this affect our shadows? Well, if we have this image of a tree in the morning as the sun is rising, that tree's shadow is going to be elongated. It's gonna be longer. And then as it gets higher in the sky and directly above, that shadow is going to be shorter. And then again, in the late afternoon, the shadow becomes elongated again and stretches the other way. So you can recreate this experiment um, by just using a plastic animal, a figurine, or um, like a doll or something. So I used my little plastic elephant and a flashlight. And all I did was put my elbow on the table and move, held the flashlight in my fist and kind of pretended to move just like the sun would move. So picking up my elbow, kind of like your arm wrestling. So here was my morning and you can see the elephant's shadow is long stretching off the box. Then at noon, it's short and really close and the elephant is lightly or brightly lit. And then in the evening, you can see his shadow starts to extend the other way. So that's something easy you can try on your own um, with just a flashlight and a plastic animal. You can also create a sundial. So on the left is a picture of a real sundial. It's got Roman numerals on it. So sundials help us tell time. So they're kind of outdoor clocks. Um, of course, they only work during day. So if you went out and wanted to know what time of night it was, your sundial would not be helpful to you. Um, but it does work um, from dawn till dusk. So sundials, of course, were useful before we had clocks, before you could just check your phone to see what time it was. Um, so people relied on the sun and the location of their shadows to tell them what time it was. So you can create a sundial um, just like this one here. Um, this has a wooden dowel in the middle. And of course it works from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. So in the summer it might get a little longer. You'd be able to tell because the sun is out, the day is a little longer. Uh, in the winter, your days are gonna be shorter so it's gonna be less. But either way, um, the way it works is the shadow moves across the dial as the day goes on um, because of the sun's location in the sky. So this person up top has just started theirs. So this is something you could easily do. Just a pencil in the middle um, with cardboard and it's weighed down with little rocks. And then it's got a circular, um, a circular piece of paper in the middle. And all they're doing is Every hour on the hour, they're going to write um, that dot, and then eventually you can use the ruler to connect the dot to the center and make those little lines. 
But all they're going to do is every hour on the hour, make a little mark. Um, and then the next day, they'll be able to use it and tell what time it is. So they're starting again here at six and then going to move all the way to um, the nighttime till it gets dark. So that is something quick and easy. It just takes uh, one day going out every hour on the hour to measure the time. You can also make a human sundial. So this little guy, he's standing on the corner of that concrete. So he's in the same spot every hour. And you can see um, he's either had a grown up or a buddy uh, trace around his shadow. So you can see the changes in the shadow and he's made himself the human sundial. So you could see here, it starts at one with a very short shadow because that's when the sun is at its highest in the sky. Then we have at two somewhere behind him, three, four, five, and then now with his shadow very, very long at um, six o'clock. So that is something you can do if you have um, a friend and some chalk. All right, that's all I have for you today about shadows. Thank you so much for joining us and I'll see you next time. Thank you, Ms. Ram. We do have a question. How do you make your shadow larger? Indoors, you can change the size of a shadow by moving your body or the object closer to or farther from the light. Shadows grow bigger and fuzzier as the object moves closer to the light so it's and smaller and sharper as the object moves further away. Now, Ms. Ramirez is going to talk to you about seasons. Hello, my name is Ms. Ramirez. And in this segment, we're going to be learning all about the seasons. So I do have an animal friend to introduce you guys to, and that is because the seasons will impact the plants and animals that we see, as well as their behaviors. So let me show you guys my animal friend. You've probably met him before. His name is Spike, and he is a bearded dragon lizard. So if y'all remember, he gets that name because he has that big beard of skin underneath his chin. When he gets scared or mad, he can inflate that beard to make him look big and scary. Now we know that during the summertime, we often see the reptiles and those cold-blooded animals, they're more active versus the wintertime when it's colder, the reptile friends are really not seen a lot. They're kind of lethargic. Some of them go into a state of hibernation called brumation. So depending upon the season, we might see different plants and different animals and it impacts their behaviors. So I'm gonna go ahead and put Spike, our little animal friend up and we'll get started with the cause of the season. So let me get that screen share started. I do have a couple of essential questions for y'all. So hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll be able to answer these two questions. The first question is what causes the seasons? The second is what is the summer solstice? So keep those two questions in mind as we go through the presentation. And what we have here, we're gonna be doing a little demonstration to help model the reason for the season. As you watch this demonstration, be thinking about what are some limitations of this model? So I'm gonna go ahead and play the video. What are some things that you notice or see on our globe? So the first thing we see is that we notice that planet Earth is tilted. And we notice that it is tilted at about a 23 and a half degree tilt along what's called an axis. An axis is just an imaginary line that goes through the center of our planet. And that is the line through which Earth rotates or spins around. And you guys learned in the earlier segment that rotating is what causes day and night. You'll also notice on our globe, we have another line and it's this big long blue line that you guys see here. That line is called the equator. It's another imaginary line uh, that separates the Northern hemisphere from the Southern hemisphere. And you all know that we live on the Northern hemisphere. We live right over here on in North America and we live in the United States. In this model, we're gonna be exploring how Earth's tilt creates the seasons. So let's take a look at our first position. So here we have planet Earth and here is the sun. When the Earth is in this position around its orbit, what season do you think the Northern Hemisphere is experiencing? I'll give you guys just a quick second to think about it. And hopefully you guys said that the Northern Hemisphere is experiencing its summertime. And we know that because if we look at the tilt, the tilt is facing toward the sun. So that means those people living on the northern hemisphere are receiving more direct rays from the sun. So they're experiencing their summertime. 
Now on the opposite end, those living in the southern hemisphere are experiencing their winter time because they are receiving more indirect rays from the sun. Now we also have what's called the summer solstice. Think of it as like the beginning of summertime and it's usually around June 20th to June 21st. And during the summer solstice, the Earth's tilt toward the sun is at its maximum. So during this time, we will have our longest day of the year. Now our Earth is gonna continue to revolve or orbit around the sun. Again, that just means it's going to move around. So we're gonna make it revolve and now we're in this position. But what do you guys notice about the location of our planet now? So hopefully you guys noticed that the axis is now no longer pointing either toward or away from the sun. So because of this position, the Northern hemisphere is now experiencing their fall time. And something interesting is the fall equinox marks the first day of fall, and that's usually around September 23rd. Now, if we break down that word equinox, it sort of sounds like equal. Equinox just means on that day that the uh, length of daytime and nighttime is almost about the same. So now Earth is going to continue moving around. It's going to continue revolving or orbiting. And now we're in this position. So what season do you think is represented here for North America? And hopefully you guys notice that tilt. Uh, it is now tilted away from the sun. So that means here in North America where we live, we are actually experiencing our winter time because North America is receiving indirect rays from the sun. On the other hand, look over here, we can see that the Southern Hemisphere is now experiencing the most direct rays. So they are actually experiencing their summertime. And something interesting about this, the very first day of winter, we call it the winter solstice. The winter solstice is usually around December 21st to December 22nd. And it marks the day where the Earth's tilt is furthest away from the sun. And that's usually gonna be our shortest day of the year. Our Earth is going to continue its revolution around the sun. And now we're here at this point. So what season do you think is represented by this? And hopefully you guys are the season of spring. So again, notice the tilt. This time the tilt is not faced toward the sun. It's not faced away from the sun. And so because of its position, we now have another equinox. Uh, so the spring equinox, also called the vernal equinox, is, is around March 21st. During the equinox, we experience roughly equal daylight hours and nighttime hours. Now we're going to continue revolving around and we're back to our first position. Again, we're back to the summertime for the Northern Hemisphere. And hopefully you guys notice that the direction of the tilt never changed. So it was always tilted this way, no matter which way it went as it revolved. And again, we know that the tilt is responsible for the seasons. It's also important to note that as the Earth is revolving around the sun, it's also rotating. So just keep in mind the Earth is revolving and rotating at the same time. This is a quick little poem to help you guys remember what revolution means. So your left hand is going to represent the sun. You can go ahead and ball it in a fist. Your right hand is going to represent the Earth. You can also make it into a fist. And we're going to start our little rhyme. Revolution, revolve. How does the Earth revolve? Revolution, revolve. How does the Earth revolve? Earth makes an orbit, orbit around the sun. Earth makes an orbit, orbit around the sun. Now we're going to pretend we are the Earth. So go ahead and take your index finger, put it on your head, and tilt just like our tilted Earth. Remember, it's tilted at 23 and a half degrees. And we're going to sing our next part. The tilt brings the seasons, winter, spring, summer, fall. The tilt brings the seasons, winter, spring, summer, fall. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and stop it there and we're going to look at a little review slide. So I want to, I have a little quiz for you guys. See if you can identify the seasons for the Northern Hemisphere in this diagram. So if we look at this diagram, we have position A, B, C, and D. So see if you guys can identify the seasons for the Northern Hemisphere for each of those, uh, each of those positions. While you guys are trying to figure that out, uh, just a couple of review things. Seasons are caused by Earth's tilt 
and revolution. So remember the revolution is the path that the earth makes around the sun. And I have a couple of thinking questions. What do you think would happen if the earth was not tilted? Also think about what would happen if the earth did not revolve? And I have a misconception alert for y'all. I just want y'all to be aware that the seasons are not caused due to earth being closer or further from the sun. So distance doesn't play a role in the seasons. While it is true that Earth's orbit is not a perfect circle, but compared to how far away the sun is, the small change in the Earth's distance throughout the year, it doesn't make much a difference to our weather. In fact, when Earth is closest to the sun, the Northern Hemisphere is actually experiencing its winter. So again, we know that the distance does not play a role. Instead, we know that the seasons are caused by Earth's tilt and the revolution. I just want to show you guys a quick little online seasons interactive from step up. So let me pull that up really quick. And this is a fun little interactive for y'all to play with. So you can see here I have my equator, which is the red line. I have it shown to have the tilt at 23 and a half degrees. You can play around and see where the sun is positioned as it makes its orbit or revolution around the sun. And that will give you a better idea of the position the Earth is in and how it relates to the season. So you guys can play around with this. You can also play around with what happens if the Earth did not have a tilt and it was zero degrees versus if it was 23 and a half degrees. So that's just a fun little thing to play with. Um, but that's all I have for you guys today on the seasons. We're going to give it back to Dr. Gorman to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Ramirez. And a student asked a question that I should be asking him. What is my favorite season of the year? Well, my favorite season of the year is the spring because I am tired of winter. Every year when it gets through, I am ready for the spring. Now, I want you to answer the same question and be able to explain why you like your favorite season. And now Mr. Monroe is going to tell us about the lunar cycle. Hello everyone, we're going to be looking at a cycle that deals with the moon. It's called the lunar cycle. In fact, to understand the lunar cycle, we've got to understand something else, the word phases, because the moon's phases actually indicate different stages in that cycle. And we know that a cycle just continue, continuously goes around and around, beginning to the end, and then a new beginning to the end, and it just never stops, does it? Listen, you know, one night you might look at the moon and it might appear to be a tiny sliver in the sky. A few nights later on, you may look at it again and it probably will have a different shape. Maybe uh, if you wait long enough, it might be a complete ball, a ball of light, similar to our sun. I know that when I was very young, about your age, I experienced that. And it caused me to wonder why. Well, hopefully by the end of this uh, presentation that I'm going to do for you, you'll get an understanding of why that happens. And also I want you to remember this about how long it takes because it can take, I guess, you know, we talk about days and we talk about weeks and we talk about months. It might take a month for this to happen, but I want you guys to know for sure how long the lunar cycle takes, okay? Now, at the end of the presentation, I'm going to use this model here of the sun, the planet Earth, and this moon image right here. Now, hopefully it'll work this time, but I'm not going to delay any longer. I'm going to go ahead and start the presentation by bringing up another screen. So bear with me while I bring this other screen up and we will get started. Are you guys ready? Hopefully you are. Moon phase. And that's what we're going to be looking at because these are the stages in the cycle that we call the lunar cycle. Well, you know, half of the moon is always lit up by the sun. As the moon orbits the earth, 
different parts are lit by the sun. And, you know, that was one misconception that I had when I was your age. I have always thought that the sun had its own light, but it doesn't, does it? Actually, the light rays coming from the sun, sun reflecting off the moon gives it its light, okay? The revolution of the moon around the earth makes the moon look as if it is changing shape in the sky. We always see the same side of the moon. There's a side that we don't see, students, and you'll hear about that a little later on. The phase of the moon that we see depends on the orientation of the earth and the moon relative to the sun. The moon's phases are caused by the part of the lid half we can see on earth. And we can see these images here that it appears that the moon is actually taking different shapes. We see the slither right here. It's a little larger here, a little larger here, a little larger here. And then here it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger until we get to what we call the full moon. The moon orbits the earth once in about 28 days. Now, about 28 days is pretty close to a month, isn't it? So we can say that probably the lunar cycle lasts about a month. Now this changes which half of the moon is lit by the sun and how much of that part can be seen from earth. The moon changes in position in the sky each day. The moon changes in appearance. These changes are called phases. Remember that now. The length of time from the new moon to the new moon is called the lunar month or synodic period of the moon. It is 29.53 days long. The moon rises in the east and sets in the west daily, but its position in the sky moves eastward by about 13 degrees per day. The side we cannot see on the earth is lit by the sun. The full moon, the side of the moon facing the earth is lit by the sun and we can see that right. We're getting the uh, the moon is getting all the light and heat rays that it possibly get could get from the sun at that distance. So it's not really the moon. Remember this: it's not really the moon giving off light. It's simply using the reflection of the sun's light. Now there are some terms that describe different phases of the moon. Waxing. If you hear that word, it means to increase in size or grow larger. Now we're not talking about the moon getting bigger or getting smaller. We're talking about the amount of light or the amount of the surface of the moon that is being lit up by the sun's light. From the new moon to the full moon, we see in this image, and it also has uh, the days. Now starting out with the new crescent, this is the progression of it. At day two, we can see that the crescent is beginning to grow, getting bigger. At day three, we're starting to see more of a lit surface. At day four, it's getting bigger. Day five, it's getting even bigger. Day six, it's getting larger. Day seven, it's getting bigger. And look at day eight. Day nine or day 10, it's really lit up. And at day 11, wow, we're getting close to a full moon. And then day 12, golly, very close to a full moon. Here it is indeed a full moon. Now, once it reaches a full moon, something else is going to happen. Waning. Waning is another term that describes the amount of light that uh, is being reflected from the moon. Now, waning means to decrease in size or grow smaller. So from the full moon, we start getting smaller surface, a smaller surface of the moon being lit up by the sun. And 
You can see with these images, getting smaller, 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 and smaller, back to a slither. One thing I did notice that if we go back and we look at the slither here in waxing, that slither is located in a different area, right? Let's go back to this other one. Look where it's located on this image toward the bottom. So actually waning is getting smaller. Now there's another word, a term that is used with the phases describing certain phases of the moon. And that is the word gibbous. Gibbous is used when there is more than 50% of the moon visible. Now that's over half, right? So in this image, we can see this is gibbous and this is gibbous. Now a crescent describes when it is less than 50% of the moon being lit up or visible. Here we have less than 50% and over here less than 50%. So that word is the word crescent that describes that condition at that particular phase. And then we have a half moon, which they really call a quarter of a moon, okay? Now, people have been interested in the phases of the moon, oh man, thousands and thousands of years ago. Early people, early men, uh, even established calendars according to the phases of the moon. In fact, the Chinese, also use the phases of the moon with uh, a zodiac uh, program that they have. Now, also there are people that describe different phases of the moon as being different times when they can think about themselves and what they need to do to make themselves a little better person. For example, the first quarter, we see the word action. I'm pretty sure that means that person needs to take a little action in what they believe in. And here we have an assessment. We know that assessment means to test, to evaluate, to figure out. Here we have, with the full moon culminating. Ah, really putting it together. And then here with the waning gibbous, we have cooperation. Maybe need to work on cooperating with people, or working in groups. And then here we have contemplation, deep thought, thinking about those things that are on your mind. And then we have the waning crescent, which immersion, putting oneself into it, putting your full energy into it. And then the new moon, a beginning. And then we have the waxing crescent, meaning starting to grow, to get larger. This is what the new moon would appear to look like. Dark. And on those nights that we have a new moon, it's dark. Here we have the waxing crest. Remember what waxing means. It means it's going to be growing or increasing, getting larger, okay? Then we have the first quarter, it's getting bigger. The waxing gibbous. What that waxing gibbous means is that gibbous means more than 50%, more than half of the moon that is, vis is visible is lit up. And then we have the full moon. From the full moon, we start waning. The waning gibbous is still more than 50% of the surface, visible surface is lit. And then we have the last quarter the waning crescent, and then the new moon. And then because it is a cycle, it will start all over again with a new month. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen right there. And let's look at this model, see if I can get it to work so you guys can see the motion relationship that causes the phases of the moon. Here we have the sun, planet Earth, and the moon. And we know that revolution means it's an orbit around. We orbit, the planet Earth orbits around the sun and the moon orbits around us. And while that is all happening, remember Mr. Dominguez and 
Miss Ramirez talking about day and season, about rotation, rotating. Our planet is rotating. And the moon also is rotating. But you know what, guys? We never see one side of that moon. We've never seen it, okay? Here on Earth, we've never seen it. All right, here we go. Let's see if this thing is going to revolve. Yeah, she's spinning. That's the type of action that is creating the lunar cycle, moon phases. Now, I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Gorman. So if any of you have any questions, I bet he can answer them for you. You guys have a good day the rest of the day. Thank you, Mr. Monroe. And Mr. Monroe just said we've never seen the backside of the moon. We always see, always see the same side, but somebody has. Who do you think has seen the backside of the moon? How about the Apollo 8 astronauts? In 1968, the Apollo 8 orbited around and the astronauts saw the backside of the moon. And then in 2019, uh, a Chinese chain, Change 4 landed on the backside of the moon in January of 2019. So it took a while for them to get around there and land, didn't it? All the way from 1968 to 2019. Okay, thank you again. And now I'm going to share my screen. During this virtual field trip, students will analyze data to identify sequences and predict patterns of changes in shadows, seasons, and observable appearance of the moon over time. Mr. Dominguez talked about the day and the night. Shadows discussed by Ms. Ram. Mr. Maris did the seasons. And Mr. Monroe just got through doing the lunar cycle. Now, teachers, thank you so much for joining us. If you would, please go to www.tiny.cc slash three dash five feedback. Fill out a very short form and send it to us. We would appreciate your input on the program. Uh, thank you again. You guys have a great day the rest of this beautiful winter day. And also have a great rest of your life.